The African Company was the first known black theater troupe. In 1816, William Henry Brown, a retired West Indian steamship steward, acquired a house on Thomas Street in Lower Manhattan, New York City. He offered a The African Company was the first known black theater troupe. In 1816, William Henry Brown, a retired West Indian steamship steward, acquired a house on Thomas Street in Lower Manhattan, New York City. He offered a variety of instrumental and vocal entertainments on Sunday afternoons in his tea garden, attracting a sizable audience. In 1821, Brown moved to Mercer and Bleecker Street, into a two-story house with a spacious tea garden. He converted the second floor into a 300-seat theater and renamed the enterprise the African Grove Theater, opening the season with a performance of Richard III, September 21, 1821. The company mounted productions ranging from Shakespeare to pantomime to farce. Brown followed with Tom and Jerry or Life in London, The Poor Soldier, Othello, Don Juan, and Obi, or Three-Fingered Jack. Brown also wrote and staged the first African-American play, the drama of King Shotaway, 1823, a historical drama based on the Black Carib War in St. Vincent in 1796 against both English and French settlers. The company's principal actors were James Hewlett, the first African-American Shakespearean actor, and a young teenager, Ira Aldridge. They learned their craft while sitting in the balcony of Stephen Price's landmark Park Theater, observing the acting styles of European transports in Shakespearean plays. As the African Groves Theater popularity grew, it became a diversion and meeting place for white patrons. The company lasted three years before it was burned down in 1823 under inauspicious circumstances. Shortly thereafter, Ira Allridge, by now one of the company's leading performers, sailed to London where he was free to practice his craft as a respected professional. Aldridge reached the pinnacle of acclaim internationally as a stage actor for over 42 years throughout the capitals of Europe. The African Grove's legacy is one of inclusion and diversity before those were things that people even strive for. This is Black Excellence. Good evening, and welcome to the 10th anniversary three-day celebration of Project One Voice. <laughs> My name is Eric McMillan McCall. I am founder and CEO of Project One Voice. On behalf of the board of directors, I would like to welcome you all to the African Grove Virtual Performing Arts Center. Project One Voice is an organization dedicated to supporting theater and the performing arts by people of African descent. We have dedicated the past 10 years to uplifting other Black creatives and providing education on the contributions of Black artists through the history of the United States and beyond. With our new virtual performance platform, programming, and initiatives like us supporting us, we will continue this necessary work and draw additional support. We believe 
that the key to continuing our robust and rich history of black creativity in this country will depend on four areas of action, sustainability, endowments, accessibility, and thrive ability. This is how we will endure and exceed. These three days are intended to connect us to our varied and robust past, present, and future. During these three days, we will be commu commemorating the emancipation of our collective and individual voices, paving the way for the better future that is always ours to claim. Now, the theme of the first night of celebration is liberation. Freedom from all limits on thought and behavior. Tonight, we celebrate the legacy of the first black theater company in this country, the African Grove, with a panel discussion moderated by Michael Dinwiddie. Now, to introduce Michael Dinwiddie is Dr. Jonathan Dewberry. Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure and honor to be here this evening, especially to introduce Michael Dinwiddie. Uh, Michael and I go back to Detroit, Michigan, the same high school, Cass, technical high school, and also at NYU. And this particular forum is most interesting to me because at NYU, I did my doctorate on the Negro Actors Guild. And the first chapter of my dissertation was on the African Grove Theater and Ira Aldridge and James Hewlett as the um, sort of progenitors of black theater and black performers, serious black performers taken seriously. So I am pleased to introduce Michael, who is a playwright, composer. His works have been produced in New York, regionally and educational theater. He has served as playwright in residence at Michigan State University, Florida A&M University, St. Louis University, and La Universidad de Palermo in Buenos Aires, among others. His awards include a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Playwriting and a Walt Disney Fellowship at Touchstone Pictures. He has published articles and lectured on the Harlem Renaissance, ragtime music, African-American theater, and spoken word rap popular culture. In 2018, he was inducted into the College of Fellows of the American Theater at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. He is editor of On Holy Ground, an anthology of plays and monologues from the National Black Theater Festival, which will be published by the Theater Communications Group in 2022. Michael is a member of the Dramatists Guild, ASCAP, the Writers Guild of America, and the Black Theater Network. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce our moderator this evening, Michael Dinwiddie. Wow. Thank you, Jonathan, for that really lovely, lovely introduction. Cass Tech, Raw Class 73, Detroit, yay. Thanks for that shout out. And Erich, thank you for inviting me to moderate this panel on the African Grove Theater. I also want to send out a special thanks to James Horton, Vice President, Education and Engagement at the Museum of the City of New York, for putting together that lovely introduction to our conversation tonight, helping us frame our discussion the piece on the African Grove Theater, quite lovely. And I wanna thank our curators, KB Sane and Zahira Sultan, as well as our interpreters, Jonathan Webb, who you'll see now, and Katura Lee, who you will see later this evening. So to get us started, I'd like to say, I acknowledge that I was born in Muskogee, Oklahoma, located in the Creek Indian Nation and I make my home on the ancestral land of the Lenape people, whose spirit forever lingers here. From my terrace in New York City, at the intersection of Bleecker and Mercer Streets, I can actually view the site where the African Grove Theater was built in 1821. We must always acknowledge where we are, who we are, 
and honor those who made the way for us. Now, I would like to introduce the panelists who are going to do everything. They're going to do all the heavy lifting. I just get to ask a few questions, so I'm excited about that. They're going to share their incredible knowledge and personal histories in the theater and in academia. We aren't going to try to cover all 200 years in the 40 minutes or so we have, but the format tonight is 40 minutes of conversation and a few minutes at the end, 20 minutes or so, for questions from the audience. So please do put your questions into the chat. And I'm going to do this because I'm a theater person, I'm gonna introduce my stars in alphabetical order. First is Dr. Marvin McAllister. He's worked in English, theater, and African-American studies departments, programs at the University of South Carolina, Columbia, Cleveland State University, Howard University, Hunter College, the City University of New York's Graduate Center, College of William & Mary, and many, many others. Now, the reason he, he's so special and wonderful tonight is he wrote a book called White People Do Not Know How to Behave at Entertainments Designed for Ladies and Gentlemen of Color, William Brown's African and American Theater. And his other book is called Whiting Up, White Face Minstrels and Stage Europeans in African American Performance. Now he's worked as a dramaturg and literary manager for theaters all across the country, Washington DC, Chicago, Seattle, most notably serving as the first literary manager for the Shakespeare Theater Company in the nation's capital. His original plays have been produced as well and in a fitting merger of academic and artistic interests, he's currently writing a play, The Drama of King Shottaway, Rehearsals for Afro-America's First Drama in Three Acts. Welcome, Marvin. Thank you for having me. Oh, we're so glad you're here. Next up is a lady who I've known way too long, Eileen Morris. She is the award-winning director, actress, and educator from the Ensemble Theater in Houston. Hi, Eileen. She's produced over 87 productions. You wouldn't know where to look at her. She's been working hard a long time, including eight world premieres and 64 regional premieres. Her many awards include the USITT Thomas de Gattini Award for her contributions to the performing arts community in Texas. She'll receive that in April. She received Broadway World Houston's 2018 Best Director Award for Sassy Mamas. She was named one of Houston Women's Magazine's 50 Most Influential Women. Now, Eileen was also among the distinguished five female artistic leaders collected as the first in the nation awarded part of a $1.25 million grant of the Pussycat Foundation and Northern State in support of women artistic directors in professional theaters across the United States. Her most recent ensemble directing credits include School Girls, where the mean African girls play, More Than Christmas, Free to Peoples, Too, have, too Heavy for Your Pocket, The Kink in My Hair, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, all right, I won't act it out, I'm sorry, I'll read, Front Court Society, uh, plenty of time, Detroit 67, what I learned in Paris, just to name a few. Welcome, Miss Morris. Hi, everybody. Hello, happy Saturday, happy Juneteenth. Yes. Thank you so much for having us here. Thank you. And finally, Awoye Tempo. Hi, Awoye, how are you? So good to see you. She's a Brooklyn based director and producer. Off-Broadway credits include, her directing credits include Old Age, New York Theater Workshop, Good Grief at the Vineyard Theater, Revive, Revolving Cycles Truly and Steadily Rolled at the Playwrights Realm, and The Homecoming Queen at Atlantic Theater's Community Company. Regionally, she's directed Pipeline at the Studio Theater, Everybody Black at Actors Theater of Louisville, and Paradise Blue at um, hmm, Long Wharf Theater. <laughs> Additional credits include Carnival, the National Black Theater, Sister Sanji at the Billy Holiday Theater, The Vanish, site-specific, Skeleton Crew at Chester Theater Company, and In the Belly Funeral at 59 East 59th Street. She directed Edinburgh Festival, Summer Hall, South African Tour. Now, there's one credit she doesn't have on here, but we're gonna talk about it, and she was the Associate Director, is that the correct title? Assistant Director, mm -hmm. Get it right, the Assistant Director for George Wolf's amazing production of, give me the title, Voyage. Shuffle Along, the making of the musical, I can't remember, of 1921 <laughs> and all that followed. <laughs> That's why I put it on you, because I did not want to mess it up. I did not want George to be mad at me. Okay, so first of all, welcome panelists. I'm so glad you're here. And uh, I'm going to start with Marvin first, because Marvin, you wrote this book, and I want to know 
you know, your title, White People Do Not Know How to Behave in Entertainments for Ladies and Gentlemen of Color. Would you tell us how you came up with that moniker and how did you become interested in the, this, this topic? Okay, uh, so let me start with um, how I first heard about the subject of the African theater. So um, actually, Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan uh, uh, Dewberry, who introduced you, the first place I actually heard about the theater was through an article that he wrote back in 1982 about the African Grove Theater. And that piqued my interest when I was an undergrad. Uh, last two years of my undergrad, I did a research project where I was trying to develop an African-American theater course because my university didn't have one. And so I was uh, digging around looking for sources and I came across his uh, essay in I think it was Black Literature Forum. And after him, I also was inspired by uh, Errol Hill, uh, Shakespeare and Sable, talks about the uh, African theater, African Grove, Hewlett, and uh, Aldridge. But also a really big influence was uh, Dr. Samuel Hay, uh, African-American theater, uh, historical, uh, what is it, historical and critical analysis. He does some really good work on there, some really good archival work, sort of stitching things together. So that's how I got interested in the subject. Now, as for the title, the title is a rumor. It's a legend. We don't know that that was actually said or ever done, but here's the backstory real quick. So um, rowdy white folks loved to come see uh, William Brown's theater up in the village. And he needed that patronage to keep his uh, Mercer, uh, Mercer Street Theater open. And so what he had to put up with was a lot of rowdy folks. Uh, one summer, one hot summer, it led to a riot in August, 1822. But leading up to that, there was all kinds of scuffles, breaking of things, beating, beating up of people. And so what he did was he created at the back on the pit level of the auditorium, he created a partition. Now, some people think to, seem to think like George O'Dell, who's a, a, a famous Columbia uh, theater historian, when he heard or when he read, when he found in the archive, that Brown created this partition, he was like, oh my God, how horrible that is. A black man segregating his own people. George O'Dell got it wrong. What Brown was actually doing was segregating rowdy white working class patrons behind this partition. And the legend goes, and I'll tell you where we got the legend from in a second. The legend goes that he put a sign on the partition explaining why this sign had to be here because white people do not know how to behave at entertainment designed for ladies and gentlemen of color. It was a class thing. It was an elite thing. It was a culture thing. And these, wadi, or these rowdy white patrons uh, were just disrupting the show. Where does the legend come from? First, during the WPA period, Federal Theater Project, they were doing all of these histories. And uh, uh, Weatherby and, and, and Roy Ote did a history in which they talked about the legend of this sign. Gave us no evidence, no sources that I could go track down, none of that. Mm -hmm. Then again, in the 1960s, Lofton Mitchell and Langston Hughes picked up the same rumor, the same legend. And the way they interpreted that partition and that sign is that, let's be clear, William Brown allowed people of any color to sit wherever they wanted, but he encouraged the rowdy folks paying for the cheaper seats at the back of the pit to sit behind this partition so he could kind of quarantine them and hopefully they would behave. But so that's where the title came from. And it's so, a It's a legend. It's a rumor. But so you, you could say that in some ways it's fake news. Yes. <laughs> because well, it, 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 On the surface, it's fake news, but it speaks to a reality in terms of yeah. the class tensions and the racial tensions in the theater. Yeah. And also who's in, who's in control of the seating, who's in control of access. Now he's not gonna turn that money away, right? Right. But he doesn't want those white patrons sitting in his boxes. He doesn't want them sitting close to the stage. So he has a place for them. And if they didn't want to sit amongst other black folk, you know, they could sit right behind their partition and have that little sign explaining why. Well, that helps set us up for what we're going to talk about, which is the plays he did, the ways in which those plays echo with the plays we do today, and the ways in which that theater, that 200 years ago, set the tone and set the space for African-American producers to follow in the footsteps of William 
William Alexander Brown. I mean, I think of Woody King in the New Federal Theater. I think of the Ensemble Theater in Houston. I think of uh, theaters all across, Negro Ensemble, I mean, theaters all across the country that had black producers. And there's something that he had, that he did that's interesting. It's controversial now. I'm gonna go to Awoye to talk about this because she's organized something called Classics. And Awoye, William, William Brown produced a lot of Shakespeare. Mm classical work at the time, but your group Classics, explain what Classics is and talk about the relationship that you have and think about in terms of Shakespeare's work. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, it's so nice to be here with you all on Juneteenth having this conversation. It's just incredible. And already so many great stories have been told. So <laughs> it's really very exciting. Um, so, um, you know, classics, you know, I, I really think of it so much as this like living, breathing organism. It, it started off as um, a as a reading series, you know, there was a number of um, classic black plays, plays by Kathleen Collins and Bill Gunn and Ron Milner and Alice Childress um, that we said, let's do a reading series so we can just, you know, celebrate all of these works, celebrate all of these writers. I had never heard before we did um, the reading series of Kathleen Collins and Bill Gunn mm -hmm. and went out and was looking for their work and was just so uh, amazed and astonished and really just in awe of these writers Writers, producers themselves, actors, just all around wonderful artists. And so we said, let's put a number of these plays um, together. And then the kind of beautiful place and way that it's grown is that in thinking about um, what the development of those plays were, thinking about why you know, I hadn't been exposed to them when I was coming up in school. We said, there's actually a number of different things that we need to touch on if we're gonna, as we bring these plays to life. And so classics ended up um, kind of evolving into a kind of a collective with four pillars. So we do readings, we collaborate with theaters on productions of these classic plays. Um, we have partnerships with educational institutions around the country so that we can integrate more and more of these plays into curriculum. Um, we also have what we call a narrative component, which is how do we sit, how do we tell stories about these plays and tell stories about these incredible artists? And then the last pillar is um, publication. So some of the plays that are really hard to find, um, you know, many of them are, some, some of them are quite accessible, but the ones that maybe never got published or are out of print, how do we bring those plays back to life so that people can have access to them? So that's that's the work that we're <laughs> that's the work that we're that we're up to, and it's really interesting to think about um, the kind of legacy of this um, of this theater, and um, you know the ways in which um, you know the the classical work, the 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 kind of European classical work that the African Grove Theater was doing. You know, we talk a lot about like who are the who are our artistic um, who are the artistic descendants of this time. You know, what are the seeds of artistry that got planted? during this time. And for us, it's really cool to look back and see how, you know, if you even take someone like Ira Aldridge and the work that he was doing and how he then inspired other companies, inspired the Ira Aldridge players. You know, we're in the midst right now of doing a whole podcast about Black performance in the era of minstrelsy. So we're looking at the Ira Aldridge players. We're looking at the Georgia minstrels and looking at all the different companies and all the different producers who have been producing over that past um, 200 years. So it's really, um, it just it just goes to show that, you know, Black artists are always going to be doing the thing that artists do, which is trying to reimagine the world, trying to reflect the world, trying to remake the world, um, and to know that, that that legacy of 200 years ago is exactly what we're living through and trying to do now. Right. When you talk about reimagining and reworking, hi, Katora, welcome. Glad to, glad to have you with us now. Welcome. When you talk about reimagining and rethinking, I go, I think instantly of Eileen Morris and the Ensemble Theater. So Eileen, tell us a little bit about the Ensemble Theater um, in Houston, because we don't know very much about it. Okay, great. Well, first of all, let me say thank you to Eric and the Project One Voice Board and staff and all those persons who helped make this possible. Uh, thanks very much to each and every one of us on the panel. It's uh, my pleasure to be, I've never met uh, either one of you, Marvin, or. Uh, and one new. Awoye. Mm -hmm. Awoye, I'm sorry, Awoye, <laughs> Mr. Awoye. So it's my pleasure to be here with you guys today. Um, so Mr. Hawkins, same thing. I mean, when you fast forward and think about 
the work that the Ensemble Theater has done. And we're turning 45 years old in September. So pause, um, pause question. Mr. Hawkins, who's Mr. Hawkins? George Hawkins. I'm gonna I was gonna talk about him. Mr. Okay, Hawkins, I'll... the ensemble theater is turning 45 years old. And Mr. George Hawkins is the found was the founder of the ensemble theater. So during, you know, he founded the ensemble because of the fact that he wanted to provide a place where African American artists could tell their stories. So that the trajectory of of what was going on in the world, the stories and the legacies that he had and experiences that he had, they could be told and found out in a way so that others could view them and be a part of them. And there was no place for that. I mean, there wasn't a place that African Americans could consistently go and tell the story. So in when founding the Ensemble Theater, he started doing uh, you know, the classics that we know, American classics, African American classics, but also classics such as you know, Shakespeare or Midsummer Night's Dream with a with an African American art, uh, you know, audience and uh, and artists that were involved in that. And the reason that he incorporated both worlds, I think, was because of the fact that you know, when you're first starting off, you're trying to figure out where your place is and how the world is going to perceive and and uh, you know, kind of view. I was thinking about uh, when Dr. Marvin was talking about uh, the the fake news about uh you know white audiences and i think about ensemble audiences and sometimes when they come to the theater and you know we're people that are call and response and so when we see something that you know touches our soul or does something to our spirit we're gonna say amen or we're gonna say Ooh, we're gonna mm, mm, mm. we're gonna do we're gonna respond in that way because it's a part of our heritage it's a part of who we are and most times you know, Caucasian or beige people, they're telling you to shh, be quiet. It's, you know, you're not supposed to say anything. And it's com it's our come from, it's who we are. And I think that for George Hawkins in founding the Ensemble Theater, he wanted to make sure that we were able to have a place where the stories could be told in whatever way it was that were reflective of us and that young girls and, and boys, when they come to the theater, that they could see somebody on stage that looked like them and so that you know you have that kind of tie-in of what the world is and what what we are doing uh, through the art that we are disposed, you know, displaying each and every day. So we do. We were doing new works. We were doing. He was writing a lot of the, the plays that we were doing, and then again some of the classics. And and so over the years, that has changed just a little in the sense that as artistic director now, I feel like there's so much work that is being you know, written and, you know, the stories are being told that are by African-American playwrights that we're no longer taking Shakespeare and, you know, turning it into, you know, what it would be if all black artists were doing this. We typically haven't been doing that. We do the works by and about African-American, you know, people, the stories are about that. They may be written by someone else, but that story and the main theme of that play is one that reflects and, uh, uh, you know, touches the spirit of us as African American artists. One of the other ways that you connect with uh, with the African Grove Company is that you have your own theater. You own your own theater, correct? Absolutely right. So we're one of a few theater companies. There's seven of us that we know of at at this time. I don't know if this is okay for me to talk about right now, Michael. Sure. But yeah, so there's seven of us that uh, we know of that own their own facility, their own building. The Ensemble Theater is in the heart of Midtown Houston, uh, which is like in the middle of the city. Downtown is one way and then the medical center is another way. And uh, we have a 30,000 square foot facility that we've owned, that we burned the mortgage on in 2004, that we don't own a dime, owe a dime for. So we feel very, thank you guys, it's a blessing. <laughs> so we feel very blessed uh, that we've been able to do that. And there are seven, theater companies that we know of that own their own facility. And that is the West Coast, West Coast Black Troop in Sarasota, Florida, Black Ensemble Company in Chicago, Illinois, ETA in Chicago, Illinois, Hattie Lou Theater in Memphis, uh, Tennessee, the National Black Theater in uh, uh, Harlem, New York, the Arena Players in Baltimore, Maryland, hmm. and, I'm, and then the Ensemble Theater. <laughs> there you go. Well, so, first of all, I am totally impressed that you remember all, because I'm sitting here in my head going, Hallelujah. can she get all those names? I don't know. Let's see if she does. So thank you, Eileen. That's remarkable. Yeah. But the thing, you, you, you said something really interesting, and I'm going to push this back to, to Marvin, because um, 
you talked about uh, doing Shakespeare at first, and we know that we know that in the uh, African Grove Theater they did Shakespeare, but they did other plays too. They did plays uh, that were they did imports, and then they did a play that we're going to talk about later on King Shotaway. So, Marvin, give us a little insight on the on the the plays they did at the uh, African Grove Theater. All right, so picking up on what, where Eileen took us and uh, relating it to the ensemble. So uh, William, William Brown had a strategy and his strategy was to tap into the sort of three strains of performance that was going on in New York at the time. They were doing the stage Europeans, which were the Shakespeare, the white folks. They were, uh, different theaters were uh, capitalizing on stage Indian or Native American performance mm -hmm. appropriations which if we go back into the history of New York City theater, originally it was the nations themselves who came to the theater to perform, but they weren't coming anymore. And so uh, some white folks picked it up, but also some black folk picked it up like William Brown and James Hewlett. And the third thing that he eventually tapped into was the performance of stage Africans, which were the imports mm -hmm. of various musicals and pantomimes and melodramas featuring Africans, all right? And he was slow to get involved with that. But one thing that Eileen talked about was uh, instead of just doing Shakespeare, because that was his end. And if you know anything about early 19th century theater, the way you made a name for yourself is by doing the stage heroes, by doing the classics, by doing the Shakespeare, right. by doing that material. And he was brave enough, and we know the story from Carlisle Brown's play. Yeah. William Brown was brave enough to do his Shakespeare right next door to the Park Theater, as they were doing Richard III, James Hewlett was doing Richard III and other stuff. They were doing it a little bit differently. Maybe we can get into that later, but they were doing it right next door. They got caught up, they got snatched up, they got put in prison right there at Hampton's Hotel. But then what came out of that, and Carlisle Brown captures it at the end of his play, they were told, you can't do Shakespeare anymore. Of course, they didn't listen. They continued to do Shakespeare, but what came out of it is, Less than a week later, Carlisle Brown, I'm not, sorry, not Carlisle Brown, William Brown was already working on this new play. And he advertises, so they got arrested right around January 9th. And he's advertising this new play about this insurrection uh, in, the, in the Caribbean on January 16th. And so that's where he's moving. And he's moving into this stage Indian territory that is actually a stage Afro Indian territory because it's a mixture of black Africans and Carib Indians or yellow Caribs who came together to perform black Caribs. And so he's mixing those together. And then from there, and it's going to take him a year to actually, because it, it actually didn't debut in January 1822 when it was supposed to. It mm -hmm. would debut later in June 1823. But he went from there and eventually, okay, he has to take on, and he was reticent at first, he has to take on the stage African. And so he's trying to figure out how do I want to do this? How do I want to embrace this? Because, and let's be clear on this, the name African Grove was imposed on William Brown. Mm -hmm. He did not adapt that name. That name was given to him by Manuel Mordecai Noah, editor of the National Advocate, who thought he was being cute by slapping the title African Grove on this black late night pleasure garden. And William Brown being a smart businessman, all this free publicity, I'm on a roll with that name, but that is not the name that he chose. Names that he chose were names like the Minor Theater. He at one point called himself the American Theater. And when he was an American Theater, guess what he did? He did a stage Indian play called She Would Be a Soldier, written by who? Manuel Mordecai Noah. Right, the oh, guy tried to malign him by giving him or dismiss him by calling him African, but Brown was going to roll with it and accept it. But he had to get into sort of a uh, ease with that name, ease with what he wanted to do with that Africanness. So eventually, he started calling his theater company the African Company, and it wasn't just for publicity. When he started calling his theater company the African Company, and when he started getting into stage Africans, he didn't do the sort of typical stage African plays, he did this out there melodrama or pantomime called Obi or Three Finger Jack, which right. is about a Jamaican maroon bandit who is a hardcore Ooh. bandit Robin Hood type figure. Ooh. And that's the stage African that he brought to stage. Also, this top of the clip video talked about Thomas, Tom and Jerry or Life in London. Brown changed that musical up. 
he changed it up to add a scene. And if you look at the playbill real closely, there's a scene added where it's a South Carolina scene. It's at a place called Vondu Range in this on the playbill is called Van Gogh Range. But the real place is Vondu Range, where a large percentage of Africans came into North America through that port. And he has a scene set in that port. And he has the one white company member that we know of that was ever part of the African company being the auctioneer in that slave market scene. And so when he becomes, so he's embraced it all, stage Europeans, stage Indians with his original drama, stage Afro Indians. And now he's trying to figure out how I'm, how am I going to stage, stage Africans for this period? And he's very strategic about how he does it. And I left out a lot of the other stage heroes like Don Juan and all that kind of stuff, but we can move on. But you know, something that's important about what you just talked about in terms of thinking about it. First of all, the notion of minor theater as opposed to major theater comes out of the English theater where the idea is the, the, the crown decides these are the major theaters and they get the patent, but then the other little theaters are the minor theaters. Right. So well, I'm gonna posit right now that I would love for you guys to think about, oh, go on. Real, real quick. And so here's how Cheeky Brown is. He calls himself the minor theater and on the same playbill, he announces this brand new African-American drama. Minor theaters aren't supposed to do the dramas. Like right. Michael said, you're supposed to do the pantomimes and the melodramas. But at the same time that he, in a passive aggressive way, calls himself the minor theater, he also announces the first African-American drama that we know of. Right, so so this guy is already messing around with everybody. He's he's a producer who moves around based on where he has to go. When, he, when his theater is destroyed at first, he builds it again, another theater um, at Mercer in Houston with a block away. So that it's on the site where NYU is now building a 14 story building that's gonna have four theater, well, a theater and three spaces in it. And I'm sure they're gonna acknowledge the African Grove in this in some way uh, as they do that. But one of the things that I thought was really important um, in what we're saying and thinking about is the, this is the legacy that is left out of the books for the most part. Mm. This is the history of American theater. And what you're talking about, Marvin, and what you put forward and what we really understand is in this early theater, we have a model of someone creating an integrated theater. And what if, what if Brown's work was known? What if it had been known? We would know that from the beginning in America, Native American culture was respected, African culture, European culture. Now, the thing about the first production they do of Richard III, Every company is doing, you know, this is like one of the most popular plays of the time because that's how you kind of like show that you can do this kind of work and everything. Um, so what? why is there such hostility towards Shakespeare for African-Americans? I mean, they come at a certain point, the, the audience, the, the, the rowdies come in and tear the costumes and burn the building. They dim the lights. It's a riot. It's a, it's a, it's a January 6th riot in the theater, basically. It's planned and, and uh, orchestrated to destroy the African Grove Theater. And one of the uh, historians says that that was the, the churches, the theaters, the schools were always the target at this time. Now remember, this is the era, Denmark Vesey in, in uh, Charleston is creating this, this uh, slave, uh, he's ready to do a rebellion. This is like a year uh, from the founding of the African Grove Theater. We also have the history, when you talk about King Shottaway, 1795, we're also talking about the period of the Haitian Revolution. Mm -hmm. So he's doing work that is political and that is traumatizing mm -hmm. the, the people in New York. Although New York's black population at the time was 6,000. Doesn't matter. Mostly tiny. I mean, a tiny population, mostly free, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, very Because emancipation would happen in 1827, but most African-Americans in New York at that time had already been freed. And I say all that to say that this guy you talked about, the newspaper journalist, really trying to foment rebellion against African-American political participation by using yeah. the theater. So yeah. he, he actually has a convention in which yeah. they push through an idea that whites, all whites can vote, but yes. any black property can vote. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is there's this threat of blackness, black power, black blacks taking over everything. And I, I go on this, this light uh, uh, talk to just show how art and culture really impact the ways in which we think about the world we're in. So I want to know, Eileen, Oye, Marvin, now I'm going to be quiet and let you talk about some of the ideas we've brought up that you want to engage with. Michael, oh, go ahead, Eileen. <laughs> no, no you're, you're fine. Go ahead. Michael, if you don't mind, I want to pick up on something you just said about that question you sort of had implicitly. What is the threat? 
Yeah. And so the art of the historian you alluded to, I think, was Emma Lipansky. Mm -hmm. And Emma Lipansky has an article or essay that talks about the threat of sort of black excellence and black advancement that was demonstrated in the churches, demonstrated by things like the African Free School, but also demonstrated by things like William Brown's entertainments. And Manuel Mordecai Noah, like Michael alluded to, was involved in one of the first acts of sort of voter suppression in, in the in, 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 in US. And it involved using the threat of Black Shakespeareans, the threat of Blacks having their own pleasure garden, the threat of a triple threat artist like James Hewlett, an artist like Ira Aldridge, an artist like Miss S. Welsh doing both male and female Shakespeare roles. The threat of that type of excellence, Manuel Mordecai Noah used that in his publication, The National Advocate, to get that convention to vote so to change the Constitution so all white men didn't have to have any property to vote, but now black men had to have like $250 in property. And so the confluence of the art and the politics, Brown was at the center of it, whether he wanted to be or not. But the key thing is, is that he accepted it and he spoke back to it. And he spoke back to it in small sort of passive aggressive ways, like I said, with the minor theater, but also in those big ways, like Michael alluded to, by doing the first African-American drama, or I'd like to call it the first African in the Americas drama about what? An insurrection, a rebellion against yeah. colonial authority. I think too, when you when uh, you know listening to you all talk about this, is I, I all in my spirit. It kept going. Wow, this is why the ensemble theater and other institutions, you know, have been founded. Other black institutions, because at the age that we are at forty five, you know, that's Crossroads Theater, Penumbra Theater Company, uh, Black Ensemble Company, St. Louis Black Rep, all founded at the same time. So not only do you have the Black Arts Movement, which was being influential to us, uh, to our founders, uh, you know, to make sure that the art was being presented in a way. But that the Black Arts Movement was influenced because of the African Grove Institute. And so you think about the fact that these institutions have come together because of the fact that they wanted their voices heard, that they wanted to be able to tell the stories, that they wanted to make sure that their stories could be told in a way that unlike any others. And that's the, that's the beauty of it. Because when I think about, I remember there was a critic, theater critic here in Houston, uh, Mr. Evan Evans. And he was one Sunday afternoon, he was watching a play at the Ensemble Theater at intermission. He came out and he said, Eileen, I don't know what we'd do if we didn't have the Ensemble Theater. But so many, because he was, he was, he was you know, engaged and, you know, feeling really connected to the work that we were doing. But so many times when you talk to others in other, you know, situations, they ask, well, why do we need black theater? If the PWIs and the other institutions are going to do the work, you know, they do their one or two, you know, black plays occasionally throughout the year. Why what do we need PWIs, Irene? Eileen, what oh, are I'm sorry, predominantly white institutions. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. If the uh, predominantly white institutions are going to do the work, why do we need black institutions to do it? Because they don't tell the story in the same way. They don't come, they come from it is it's in a different perspective. And so it's important that we uh, help them to understand or help the world to understand, you know, why we do the work that we do and the importance and the legacies and, you know, the, the ground on which we stand, as Mr. August Wilson has said to us, that we, that of the work that we do, which it's, which is based on the African Grove Institute and all of the, the kind of the history and the legacy that they've laid for us, as well as the Black Arts Movement. And I'll, I'll just add to all of that brilliance, which is to, you know, to say that it, it's to me, this the story of his um, kind of in, endurance and the, I don't know, the kind of both the kind of complexity of the work that he was producing and making during that time in opposition, not really in opposition, but living in the own truth of his own artistry. This is the kind of work that I would like to see. This is the way I would like to see us make our work. These are all the different forms and ways of, of, of us of being, you know? And I think the thing that's so 
exciting about his story and the story of the African growth theater is that you see that story time and time again, people mm -hmm. consistently trying to live in the truth of their own artistry and the truth of their own art making in order, as I was saying earlier, to serve the society in whichever way they think is, is, is the right way for them as artists. And that kind of, that, um, I think that kind of um, endurance, you see it time and time again. You see, you're going to see it, you know, 60 years later with Charles Hicks and him kind of constantly trying to reinvent the Georgia minstrels. Like there was no stopping that man. It's just like pure ingenuity. You see it, you know, decades later with the Williams and Walker company, the things that they were trying to create. It's like that is actually our story is us just consistently trying to make the work in our own image. And that's the place where the threat is. It's like the, 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 the threat is both the brilliance of the art that Black people were making, but also the ways in which they were showing the kind of the uh, more oppressive forces themselves. That's the danger is actually, it's not us. It's about the threat of you having to see yourself in a different kind of way by acknowledging who we are through our art. So it's just fast. It's just, but we tell the same, it's the same story over and over and over and over again. And that's exactly where we are now too. I'm going to even go to a more historical kind of framing, chronology. 1821, you have in New York State a convention in which the Republican Party, not as the same as the one today, but the Republican Party is suppressing the Black vote. In 2021, and they're doing it legally through the legislature. In 2021, all across America, because of the notion of the advancement of Black people, the politics of the moment, you see legislatures doing exactly the same thing in response to the fact that there's a notion that somehow people of color, and not just black people, but Asians and Arabs and people and Latinos are, are a threat to the notion of what is to be an American. And William Brown did not have this notion of a limited notion of racialized identity in terms of who we are as Americans. So I think back to um, people like Thomas Pauley and Winona Fletcher and Tom, Thomas Pogue, people who are the progenitors of the theater that we now sit and live in, of uh, Paul Lindsay, of Langston and all these people who, there was space for all kinds of theater. There was space for the music. There was space for the dance. There was space, space for the serious stuff. And the Lafayette players, who starts out only doing plays from downtown, but eventually starts to understand we have to do something different. So we believe it or not, we're getting ready to go to our question session, but I want to know, are there things you want to talk about that we, oh, and I have one more, one more point. So we have 1821, 2021, in the middle though, 1921, mm. Buffalo Law. Yeah. So Awoye, I need you to tell us a little bit about your experience as the assistant director on that show and where, where it sits in our history um, as uh, African American theater makers and people who who love the theater, it's you know it's so beautiful. Well, first of all, working on the show was, as you can imagine, just mm. life changing, transformative in every way. I think I think for everybody in the room, but I think part of it too, as we're talking about this idea of what are the stories that left behind, what are the stories that are not told. You know, I had never heard of Shuffle Along before um, starting to work on the show. There's so many artists. Mm -hmm. There may be people tonight who don't know what Shuffle Along is. So you're going to have to do a whole exegesis. As yes. You, as you, so go right ahead. Tell us everything. Yes, totally. No, you know, it was, it was a really um, incredible um, journey of a show that really transformed the American theater. It hit Broadway in 1921 with extraordinary musicians, Yubi Blake and Noble Sissel writing the score, um, and Florinoy Flora Miller and Aubrey Lyles um, creating the, the script. And it brought together, you know, some of the great great performers of the era and complete, as I say, completely transformed what we even think of a musical as. It was a first musical to incorporate a, a, a jazz score. It introduced syncopation. Um, it brought, you know, it was so, it was so popular. You know, it actually changed the geography of New York City. You know, they, it was so popular that they had to make um, 61st Street, which is where the show was, a one-way street. Um, and it was also, you know, at a very much a, a kind of artistic kind of bridge point, you know, before it, um, it's very much kind of following in the footsteps and um, in the legacy of Indahomey, but it's also going to transform, you know, what the what the rest of musical theater was going to be. But um, it was it was really an extra at the time in 1921, a transformative piece of work. Um, 
And in um, 2016, George Wolf and Savion Glover um, and Daryl Waters, you know, created a new musical to tell the story of what happened. And uh, you know, it's a really beautiful thing. I think with all of these plays to think about what's the what's the play itself, but what's also the story of these artists who yeah. made this work. Um, and um, now I can't remember the rest of your question, Michael, but that's <laughs> well, you know, a little bit of the background. You've given a lot of it so people know about it. The thing I love about, about Shuffle Along is it, it's the invention of the chorus girl. Yes. That's, that's the moment where we have one actor who can sing, dance, mm -hmm and uh, 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 perform as an actress, yeah. an invention, a new concept that now, and I love the way they, all the reviews say the show had pep, pep. Yep. And so, cause it was a new concept on Broadway. The show girl didn't stand off in the corner. The dancer didn't dance over it. The singer didn't do it. It was one person. And so Josephine Baker comes out of that chorus line uh, at a yep. certain point. Uh, we have other famous African-American artists in the same way that the African Grove launched famous artists. So I guess uh, you'd like to talk a little bit about some of the artists who came out of the African Grove. And of course, there's one who, of course, comes to mind right away. I'm gonna make Marvin start talking about it. Okay, so I, I'm i thinking you were probably gonna say Ira Aldridge. Yeah. I'm not going there, I'm gonna go James Hewlett. Oh, that's cool, okay. And the reason I'm gonna go James Hewlett is something uh, that Oye alluded to and something that Dr. Dewberry said earlier. He talked about Ira Aldridge and James Hewlett being progenitors in terms of the way African-American theater was done. And so okay. I want to go to James Hewlett because this is something Awoye alluded to earlier. James Hewlett, and I'm not going to tell the whole story, but James Hewlett had a situation where this British comedian named Charles Matthews came for him and basically ruined, um, at least tried to ruin his reputation with a slanderous performance of something that James Hewlett never did. And that famous performance, Carlisle Brown demonstrates in this play, African Company, mm -hmm. it's the opossum up a gum tree, Hamlet whole thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna tell the whole story. I got a whole like spiel for it, but I'm gonna cut it short in half. So James Hewlett performed privately for Charles Matthews. And Charles Matthews supposedly loved all of his performances. All Hewlett did was his best, best Shakespeare, his King Lear, his Richard, his Hamlet, his Macbeth, his Othello. That's all he did. But Charles Matthews had other plans. His plan was to create a basically early blackface minstrel representation of James Hewlett and call it basically the Negro tragedian. And that whole possum up a gum tree thing never happened. That was something that Charles Matthews imagined. But the story gets better. What did James Hewlett do when he heard about it? He went over to England, tried to find and confront Charles Matthews didn't find him. He came back to the States. He published a letter in the National Advocate where he basically opened a letter to Charles Matthews saying, how dare you defame a fellow actor? You know I perform my best material and you didn't see basically the content of my performance. All you saw was my color. He actually uses those words way before King. All right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, but it don't stop there. Hewlett writes the letter. And then what does Hewlett do after William Brown retires from the theater at Mercer Street? James Hewlett becomes the manager of the theater. And he starts to do this thing called an at home. And at home is a 19th century one person show, kind of like the Sarah Jones and the Anna Devere Smith of the 19th century. Guess who invented that format? Charles Matthews. Wow. James Hewlett took Charles Matthews at home and he did all of Charles Matthews pieces, but what did he add to it? He added one character called Hewlett. <laughs> and there was a performance called Hewlett. And we could just imagine, and I have all kinds of imaginings of what that performance might've been, but that's how he got back at what Charles Matthews tried to do to him on wow. multiple but, levels. But you know what you're saying, um, Michael, is that, I mean, Marvin, is that it, it just means that we really stand on such a rich platform of, of what we do in this artistry. I mean, it's, it's huge from the stories that you're telling, from the dedication, from the commitment, from the, uh, you know, the stick to of this. I use that word a lot because, it, you know, it's, it's hard to do this. It's yes. hard to make this art. This is not easy. You know, mm -hmm. there's always something, especially if you're, you're a, you know, a black or brown uh, person trying to make art in today's world. So when you look at that, the fact that we're doing it in, in all ways, even just doing this 
virtually as we've had to do over these last 16 months, those of us that have had to do it. All of us have had to try to make this work, but, but the art is so important to us. It means so much to who we are, to our being, that we can't let it go. We have to continue to tell the stories and you know make make the pathways and use the you know the kind of strength and stand on the legacies of the shuffle alongs and those you know persons that were a part of that to move forward to who we are, the past, the present, mm -hmm. going into our future in, in the Sankofa method. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it warms my heart to hear you talk about that. Well, you know, it warms mine too, because I'm, I'm looking at through, looking through the Gary Anderson uh, report he did on the Black Theater Survey 2016, 2017. And the most fascinating detail to me, of course, we look at the lack of funding for theaters and how small it has been. Yeah, Thank yeah. heaven we have the Black Seed now, which is really making sure that there's sustainability and thrivability. The Black Seed is $10 million fund, the Mellon Fund and other organizations and funding Black theater organizations to make sure they're okay. But the most fascinating thing to me that came out of the report was the number of Black theaters in this country that are more than 20 years old. So that so they have lasted no matter what, whether they get right. support or not. One of the most fascinating uh, black theater companies that I think of as really being in the tradition is the National Black Theater Festival, mm -hmm. which every other year in Winston-Salem since 1989 has staged plays from all over the country and brought thousands and tens of thousands of people together to participate in African-American theater. And so when I think of that and think about William Brown, think about this connecting legacy through the history, it really heartens me to know that these companies have lasted even when they haven't been able to get major support. I mean, I mean, I, when you read about how uh, Larry Leon Hamlin, the founder of National Black Theater Festival, went around to people's houses and had at homes mm -hmm. and raised money for different productions and things like that. And so, he, he did that, Michael, because that's, the, that's kind of who we are. That's what we know to do. We know to go and talk to our people and talk to others. We can tell a story. So you go and you tell your story about what's going on in your community and what you are trying to do, and you make that happen. You you can you help them to understand the importance and why they they've got to continue to support what it is that we do. And in speaking about the National Black Theater Festival, uh, you know I had kind of written down a, in a note for myself to remember to say that it's because of the National Black Theater Festival I feel that you know. You, when you t talk about Samuel Hay and Errol Hill and Thomas Pauley, those are part of the BTN, the Black Theater Network family, yes. first of all, let me say that. And But then the National Black Theater Festival is where all of us could come together, and it didn't matter what your status was or how old your, your company was or you know where you were in the world, you were going to come together as a people because you had a, a commonality, you had shared experiences, and you wanted to be able to share those ideas with each other, and that's about making making Black theater, telling our stories. Mm -hmm. And just to piggyback off of um, what you're saying is, you know, I think the other part of that is how to, how, you know, and I think it's the work that we all do. How do we continue to tell these stories? One of the things we talk about a lot in classics, and Michael, we've talked about this a bunch before too, is how to make sure that we tell the, tell the stories and let people make, let the stories be known so that the, so that we and future generations don't feel like they're reinventing the wheel. What are the ways that we can learn the lessons of sustainability or to understand what were the things that made, I mean, there were a lot of theater companies that didn't make it through. What was it that happened so that we can understand how do we kind of learn from the history and build from that history for, you know, the next generations to come? Because that's the story we keep seeing. Like, what were the ways that people, um, what were the attempts that people made? Incredible, brilliant attempts and what sustained and what didn't survive. Well, I'm going to mess with Marvin now because he picked his favorite, but I'm going to pick Ira Aldrich. And the reason I'm going to go with Ira, just so you know, is because it follows the path I've seen. I'm from Detroit, as Jonathan Dubarry alluded to. And when I grew up in Detroit, there was the Vest Pocket Theater. There was the Concept East Theater. The Fisher Theater did productions of African-American productions. Wayne State University had a Black theater program. So I grew up really in this universe. Uh, Detroit Repertory Theater as well. These are companies that were really performing African-American theater. But most of those companies, Vest Pocket, Concept East, they don't exist anymore. But Concept East gave us a guy named Woody King. Mm -hmm. It forced him out to come into the other world of New York and the new federal theater, which he then, in naming it, pays homage to the federal theater. 
And when you think about that as the homage of the Federal Theater, then Woody King's doing classic plays. He does the Voodoo Macbeth, which WPA had done, the Orson Welles version of it. Woody yeah. King is bringing back all this history and trying to keep alive for us. I think of Roger Furman's uh, New Heritage Theater. I think of Woe the Rivers. So there's this real kind of, so the Iris, I know, they go out into the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, James Hewitt did too, but Ira, talk about black excellence. I mean, he's celebrated all over the world. There was a wonderful play a few years ago here in New York at St. Anne's called Red Velvet. Red Velvet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He tells the story of his having been exiled from the London stage for years because he touched a white woman mm -hmm. and had to basically build his career back up to come back to London. But he was such a brilliant actor. And remember, he's gone off to London and to Paris and to uh, Russia in a time when African-Americans are still enslaved. Mm -hmm. And he's making this decision that he's gonna come back and perform in the United States after he's been decorated by all these kings and emperors and been, you know, I love the story of his carriage being pulled through the streets by the students in, you know, in uh, Petersburg. Uh, I think it was Petersburg, you'll correct me, right, Marvin? But I love the idea that he was coming back in 1867 to have a tour in the United States. Now what's happened in 1867? We've had the war, 1865. African-Americans have been free, and it's so appropriate. We're on Juneteenth, talking about Juneteenth, but again, we have to say the thing that the Black theaters do is they show that we have very different histories. That's right. Juneteenth is where, that's where I live is from, that's Texas. That's right. Okay, I'm glad it's a national holiday, but people from West Indies celebrated January the 1st because of uh, the British thing, and in America, People, African Americans, in, in, were celebrating the Emancipation Proclamation, January first, as Freedom Independence Day. So we don't want to make it simple and small. And that's what I love about William Brown because when he's putting Native Americans on stage, he's doing he's doing something different than what you find in the European theaters at the time. He's putting Native Americans on stage with dignity, mm -hmm. and he's putting them on stage in love relationships with each other, not yes. with Europeans and yes. often yes. Africans. So go on, like Marvin. And not just and not just uh, William Brown, the first uh, choreographed dance composition that we have is called Pantomime Osama. Yes, and it mm -hmm. is a black love ballet between Osama and Asana, and it was choreographed by James Hewlett. And wow. it is one of those Native American love 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 pieces. It's a pas de deux, lovely thing. I just I don't know what it looked like. I just imagined it was lovely. But I want to come back to Ira Aldridge with you. Okay, just and 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 and, and, and look at Ira Aldridge's home training young, impressionable, religious kid, grows up in Brown's company. He goes over to England. And what does he do? What And this is this and a good person to look at for uh, the Ira Aldridge stuff is Vern Lindsforce. Does excellent work on Ira Aldridge. Mm -hmm. So Ira Aldridge is killing it all over England, but mainly outside of London. And he's like playing and he's got this stellar reputation. He then goes to Eastern Europe and in Lodz, Poland, is where they loved him so much they erected a statue to his memory, right? So that's how big he gets. But in terms of the home training, when it, when uh, I, when um, when um, emancipation was announced throughout all the British possessions or whatever, and people were talking about that moment and commemorating that moment, Ira Aldridge and I can't remember when exactly. But he gave a speech, stood up in England. I don't know if it was in England or if it was in Eastern Europe, but he stood up, which was a rare thing to do, because, you know, at the Kurgan speech, most actors don't say much. You know, they don't get political, you know, but he got political and he made an impassioned speech about how this day needed to come and about emancipation. To get more details, look at uh, Bern Lindforce. And but like William Brown, like James Hewlett, Ira Aldrich was making that huge name for himself, doing the excellence, but also bringing the political voice behind it. Yeah. You know, this is when you said that about political speech, you made me think about this play called Hamilton mm -hmm. and this guy named Michael Pence going to see it with his grandchildren mm -hmm. and the actors at the end of the play coming out saying, the policies you're putting in place would keep these people out of this country. Mm -hmm. Let's rethink what we do. So you see the power of art and the yes. ways, of course, the former president who will remain nameless asked for an apology, but the real apology should come from someone who was a race baiter and someone who was preaching hatred. And what you find with William Brown, an inclusive theater, an American theater, a theater against the odds, which is what you find 
in the best theater in the world. That's, That's what right. it always is. It's always that. So I've been given the signal that it's time for me to stop talking and to hand it back over to Eric. And I want to thank you as a panel, Marvin, Eileen, and Awoye for just thank making you, this Mike. amazing, wonderful time for all of us. I hope our audience has enjoyed our talk as well. And uh, I said, you know, I want to pull your book up, Eric, and, I mean, Eric Marvin, and show it to everybody, you know, because if that's fake news, we need more of that kind of fake news. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, panelists. And uh, Eric, it's all yours. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. You're muted, brother. <laughs> You're muted, Eric. Guys, that was incredible. Thank you. Thank you. So we're we're wrapping up this this evening. Thank you so much for joining us for this this um, for our 10th anniversary special. It's the first day. Uh, before we leave, I just want to thank some some people who are very instrumental to in making this this evening work. Um, I want to thank all of our board of directors. They've done an extraordinary job putting this together. So I want to thank call them all by name. Gina Jackson, thank you so much. Hallie Morse, thank you so much. Yvette Jones Smedley, thank you so much. KB Sane, thank you so much. Kay Zahara Sultan, thank you so much. Our, you have done an extraordinary job. I can't wait to see the rest of the, the night. I also wanted to thank our partners. Our partners are the Greenwich Village Society of Historic Preservation. Thank you for all the research that you did. Thank you, the Museum of the City of New York. Thank you for coming along with us. Thank you, Black Theater Network. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we're here tomorrow night with Project One Voice Honors. I hope to see you then at seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time. For all of us here at Project One Voice, have a wonderful evening and thank you for spending your Juneteenth with us. Have a great one. Bye-bye.